Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Connie for pinch hitting for Dan Schifrin, who was uh, un unavailable tonight and unable to join us. And Dan and I had uh, worked on this program for several months already. So I know he was very disappointed that he couldn't come. Uh, also, I'd like to thank Alana. Are you still here? Yes? Alana, who is uh, Dan's right-hand person and um, has just been great in helping me with all the details. And Roni Shiloh, is Roni? Maybe Roni is still outside. Oh, there you are in the back. Thank you so much. Uh, Roni is here for a year or a little bit more from Israel with her husband. And uh, they've just been great neighbors. And she's been a wonderful help for me. And um, finally, I also want to thank Akiva Tor for coming, who was on the Shema Advisory Board for several years before this post. And uh, I'm sure you're bringing so much to uh, San Francisco as the Israeli uh, Consul General. So the journal Shema turned 40 years old this year. And 40 is the numerical equivalent of the Hebrew letter Mem, which is the first letter for the word Midbar and Mayim. And I thought about this in relation to uh, Shema, because Midbar is the desert and Mayim is water. And when I, I mention this because, especially when we think about pluralism, sometimes those of us who are deeply engaged in pluralistic dialogue feel like we're wandering around in a, in a very parched desert. And sometimes we're also really in search of a pool of water. So I thought of that and I was thinking about how we would celebrate uh, the 40th year of Shema. And it's coincidental that we happen to be moving here to California. And uh, we really uh, very much thank Josh Rolnick and his family foundation for making that possible. And Josh is gonna close the program later. He'll have his own few words. When I began editing Shema 12 years ago, I was most drawn by the challenge to create each month a brand new conversation. Each month, a blank slate for the topic. Just blank. We can come up with whatever we want. And a brand new configuration of writers and questions. And that's how I really start every single month. Blank slate, any idea we want, we come up with. Uh, through my advisory board, and then I start talking to people about the kinds of questions we'd want to explore and who might have, you know, good uh, voices to include in that conversation. The one thing that never changes from month to month is our commitment to pluralism. It's one of the core principles of the journal and it has been to, since its founding in 1970. From the very first issue, there's been a commitment to the idea that including a range of voices actually strengthens community. And that is one of the reasons why tonight we're having a launch in the form of this open conversation. So last month, uh, the topic of Shema was do-it-yourself Judaism. And I asked an array of different people to write, as I always do. And one of the people that wrote is a young woman who's uh, living in Israel. She's on a MASA program, which is a five-month Israel experience for post-college students. And she was living on an Israeli eco-farm. And uh, this is, I'm just going to capture a paragraph of what she said in the magazine. An integral concept in permaculture design is the edge effect the interaction at the borders between separate niches. The edges are where things happen. Transition zones in nature where edges meet are the most active, productive, and stable due to their biodiversity. For instance, plants that grow at the edges of a pond attract fish to feed and breed there. So designing a wavy shape to the pond rather than a circular one maximizes the edge, leading to a more active habitat. Strong ecosystems result when the borders that make up an edge are distinct yet permeable. And these edges are both productive, as Talia Oberfield wrote, and they're also scary. And we'll spend the next hour exploring why this is. Why is it that the Jewish community is so concerned today about pluralism? An old term, sociologists have been debating this for you know, 50 years, 
And why is it a hot button topic even in San Francisco in 2010? What's so frightening about it in a world that it seems just yesterday we were trying to draw in as many young people uh, from as widely varied backgrounds as possible into Jewish life and trying to find them, you know, whatever means necessary to help fertilize a dangerously aging Jewry. So this round table, and I thank everybody for joining us, is made up of thinkers and doers from many different sectors of this wonderfully creative local Jewish community. And we're gonna talk about these issues today, and there really seems uh, no better way to welcome Shema to the West Coast and uh, lured it here from its 40 years of living in the chilly Northeast. So at that time, in 1970, when Shema was started, um, really at the kitchen table of the theologian Eugene Borowitz, pluralism was understood as bringing together a group of mostly male voices that crossed the political and religious spectrum. But today, we define pluralism much more broadly, as can be seen in several issues of Shema that we've uh, devoted specifically to looking at pluralism, as well as just in every issue. So we've investigated theological pluralism based on our belief that Jews along the full spectrum of belief and non-Jews as well are created in the divine image. Textual pluralism, which highlights the breadth of diversity in our interpretive tradition. Educational pluralism, found primarily in community day schools that cross denominational lines. I know San Francisco has one of those. And expressive pluralism, which opens the experience of Judaism to such a wider range of practice. So we're going to spend about 30 minutes. I'm going to ask some questions to our panel. And then we're going to open up the floor, and uh, the questions are for you. So at the end, please stay and schmooze and uh, take copies of Shema. Take my business card. Get in touch with me if you have some good ideas to, if you want to write or you have an idea for an issue. So I'm going to just read to you some of the questions that we're going to be talking about. And so listen carefully, panelists. OK, the first one. What does it mean to create safe places that support and encourage thoughtful, if difficult, conversations? And what is our obligation in the Jewish community to create those kinds of spaces? Why the preoccupation with pluralism now? In, and in such a preoccupation, is it all the more acute in a community like the Bay Area that has, uh, encompasses to a greater extent, perhaps, significant numbers of Jews uh, on both political spectrums, on you know, each of the extremes? Every community has boundaries of one sort or another. Most of us take for granted, for example, that Jews for Jesus Aren't, aren't Jews, that they're not part of our community. So what are the boundaries for you? And if boundaries are necessary, how should they be enforced? How would, how would you imagine that those would be enforced? And should they be regulated in any way by funding agencies? Uh, last, last fall, Ben Dreyfus wrote in the foreword after the uh, reform movement's biennial that uh, religious liberals had to start to uh, frame the way liberal Judaism was and uh, to not allow Orthodox Judaism to create what was normative for Judaism. So how do liberal Jews who consider themselves pluralists engage with Jews who are not pluralists? In terms of kashrut, for example, how might a group of Jews decide on the standards of kashrut? Uh, the San Francisco Jewish Community Federation Board, under the direction of Rabbi Doug Kahn of the JCRC, has just released a set of guidelines for grantees. In part, this was a response to the Jewish Film Festival screening last summer of the film about Rachel Corey. Can such guidelines, and though you might not be familiar with these specific guidelines, uh, can these guidelines signal worry for maintaining a vibrant collection of voices? Uh, what is the connection between a communal push for peoplehood, 
which aims to pitch a very broad, wide tent for all Jews, and the creating of certain barriers for Jews around the periphery. And finally, uh, in 1983, Amos Oz, in his book In the Land of Israel, wrote, pluralism is a fact. It is imperative that we come to terms with it, even if with clenched teeth, and not get caught up in excommunications and ostracisms and banishments. This pluralism follows from the multifaceted experience of the Jewish people and of modern Israel, regardless of whether it pleases us or worries us. I believe in spiritual pluralism as a desirable condition, an abundance of approaches and traditions and opinions and lifestyles, including spiritual imports, is a potential source of creative tension. So just think about that and think about whether you agree with that or not and how that affects you as a, an artist. Okay, that's all. That, that should be pretty easy. Okay, let me introduce the panelists and then we will we'll get going on those questions. So first we have Rabbi Levi Darby. Um, is the rabbi of Congregation Kol Shofar in Tiburon, where he has been instrumental in creating a community built on the principles of spirituality, quest, practice, Torah study, and social action. Before coming to Kol Shofar, Levi served as the executive director of the Council on Jewish Life, a community building department of the LA Federation. Karen Kushner, two, two over, is the executive director of the Jewish Welcome Network, a nonprofit initiative that provides outreach consultation and resources to synagogues, agencies, and Jewish schools of all denominations and affiliations in the Bay Area. And with Anita Diamond, uh, she's a co-author of How to Raise a Jewish Child, No Experience Necessary. And with her husband, Rabbi Larry Kushner, she's written, Because Nothing Looks Like God, Where is God? What Does God Look Like? So, and then uh, Peter Stein on the far end, is the executive director of the San Francisco Jewish Film Festival. Prior to taking the helm in 2003, Peter was an executive producer at KQED. And his feature-length documentary, The Castro, which he wrote, produced, and directed, won a Peabody Award. And finally, we have Carol Zawatsky. And she is the chief program officer at the Jewish Community Center in San Francisco. She served as the founding executive director of the Maltz Museum of Jewish Heritage in Beechwood, Ohio, and as the director of education at the Jewish Museum in New York. And she was also the program coordinator at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC. Okay. You want to, you want to, they're on, right? Okay, do you want to start with uh, Levy? You want to start uh, with one of those questions? You pick one that, no, you no. don't. <laughs> uh, but I, I'll, I'll start with a question for you. Of course. Which is a good pluralist maneuver. Um, or actually, I'd, I'd start with the following challenge. Um, it's not clear that pluralism and liberalism are always the same things. It seems to me that it's very possible for there to be uh, liberal ideologies that allow for a whole variety of liberal ideologies but don't allow uh, certain opinions at their table um, and that actually w would um, are, are triumphalist in such a way so, th so that they don't accept the notion that anything outside of the scope of a liberal perspective is uh, either legitimate, relevant, or, or, or should be brought to the table. Um, there is uh, a very famous Talmudic passage, I think, that, that actually speaks to this question. Uh, it's called Tanur Shalachnai, the Oven of Achnai. Anyone who's studied a little bit of Talmud has come across this passage. But if you haven't, you can ask uh, any, any rabbi in the community uh, of any denomination to teach it to you. It's, it's a terrific passage, and it has to do with an argument between one rabbi, Rabbi Eliezer, and all the other rabbis who disagree, one against the many. Rabbi Eliezer is able to provide not only uh, logical uh, 
uh, support for his position, but he's able to, to provide supernatural support for his position, uh, the, the rabbis uh, ultimately excommunicate him. The rabbis themselves who create the rabbinic project, which is based on every opinion should be invited to the table in the interpretation of Torah. The rabbis who, who create rabbinic Judaism on the model that, uh, contra to Antonin Scalia, that the meaning of a text is not what the author wrote the text to mean, but what the reader says the text means. Those rabbis who allowed a plurality of opinions to be voiced in the Beit Midrash said that this one rabbi, Rabbi Eliezer, his opinion was not permissible, and he was, in fact, excommunicated. Is this what we do with people? So uh, the other thing I want to I, I wanna suggest is I don't know that this is a new concern. Uh, my guess is that the preoccupation with pluralism now has to do with the American Jewish community's terror over what will happen with the state of Israel. Um, and that, that that fuels it, but uh, the, the a preoccupation with pluralism has been going on for 25, 30 years in American Jewish dialogue. Some 25 or 30 years ago, one of my teachers, Rabbi Yitz Greenberg, wrote an essay in which he asked, will there be one Jewish people in the year 2000? Is there enough room for us to be able to express our religious opinions and our political opinions, and yet at the same time in diversity and yet remain one Jewish people? And how do we in fact remain one Jewish people? So I don't know that it's a new question, but I would say it's certainly a thorny one. I think it's extremely important to have both ends of the spectrum within the tent. I'm always thinking in terms of the open tent because as you heard, I work around helping institutions be ever more welcoming to interfaith families uh, of, of whom I think they've lost their voice or maybe the better image is to say that they're invisible in synagogues and often don't get spoken about. So I'm very concerned about the interfaith, the partners of, uh, in interfaith couples who are not Jewish and I'm also concerned about the new wave of adult children of interfaith couples. And we had a lot of interfaith marriage in the 80s and we're now seeing adults from those marriages. And these people are in our community, and yet they're on the periphery. And the question is, you know, how do we keep the tent open enough so that there is a periphery that is endlessly invited into the center? Because in my opinion, they can't be, they can't fall in love with Judaism, let alone falling in love with a Jew. They can't fall in love with Judaism unless they get into the center and are exposed to that rich, life-giving tradition that uh, has allowed for diversity for, for thousands of years, as Levy told us. So I, I'd like to pick up a little bit on what does it mean to create a safe space and that very much what you alluded to, that a safe space is different for different constituent groups. And when we may believe that we, what we've created is room for a dialogue, that dialogue may, as Karen says, have left people out of the, out of the conversation. What does that look like? And it's very striking to me that this conversation is taking place in a cultural arts institution. And to address the role of cultural arts in Jewish life in America today and how strong that is. It, it is not, not that this conversation perhaps couldn't have happened in a synagogue, but, but that this feels like such an appropriate space to be the contemporary Jewish museum for us to begin this conversation. Uh, following up on, on that question of a, of a safe space, I think uh, the, the question about um, how to create a tent that is both defined and yet has open, open flaps, uh, uh, this question of peoplehood, this is all of a question about definitions. And there's some who would like to define Jewish life in very precise ways. There's some who would, are, are, are suggesting that um, we can be pluralistic in the views that we listen to, but when push comes to shove, when there are issues around Israel's security, when there are issues around um, uh, the future of, of the Jewish people or continuity, that somehow definitions need to be made. Um, it used to be perhaps that rabbis made that definition and were feeling okay about ex quote unquote excommunicating. Uh, recently, when one of your questions poses the idea that perhaps funding agencies are actually creating those definitions. Um, any of, the, of that sort of um, ar arbitering of Jewish identity 
um, is a matter of concern, um, particularly uh, in, in, a, in a moment when I feel that there is fear-based uh, fear boundary making. So it, it seems to me that, that part of the problem here is, is that we have so many different kinds of communities. We have people who come to a museum. We have synagogues. We have synagogues of different denominations. We have Jewish community centers, which are Jewish organizations that invite both Jews and non-Jews to be full members. We have a whole variety of different kinds of organizations. And these different mini communities, I think, probably have a right to set boundaries around their community and decide who is in and who is out. Religiously speaking, uh, the conservative movement has certain guidelines as to who is included in the community and who is not. The reform movement has different guidelines. The reconstructionist movement has different guidelines. Centrist orthodoxy has different guidelines. Ultra-orthodoxy has different guidelines. Everyone has different guidelines. They should live and be well. Uh, pluralism may be an approach that says each mini community has the right to set its own guidelines the question is, what does it have to say about me and the guidelines that my community uh, sets? So, so the question about whether somebody may or may not be um, a, a Jewish, quote unquote, by definition for this synagogue or that synagogue or this denomination or that denomination is easily solvable by virtue of knowing the rules of each denomination, saying that's not the place for me. But when it comes to peoplehood issues, and certainly when it comes to issues around Israel, and certainly if we view ourselves as the totality Jewish community of the Bay, that makes things far more complicated. Who actually has the right to set those boundaries? I, I think that's very much the key question. Who speaks, who sets that, that boundary? Who speaks for the community? And is it a, a self-appointed voice? And as Peter began to say, was it at, at a certain time a rabbinic authority? And, and again, the reference to we're having this conversation in a cultural arts institution. Has the voice shifted? Has the voice of authority shifted from a rabbinic authority to a, um, a, a more culturally secular-based Jewish voice? You know, it's been a long time since we put people into harem. Um, it, it, this is not something that we do in the Jewish community, that we excommunicate people from, from, the, from the whole. I was put into cherem. <laughs> I, I, I was excommunicated by three rabbis in Boston in a motel room. I wasn't in the motel room. But. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> this was getting to be sort of TMI. When to <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, I, you know, when... I think the problem comes when you, we have an, an institution which tries to define itself as the arbiter for the whole Bay Area. And I think that's, you know, it's, it's maybe impossible for any one institution to really represent all of the different voices. I really liked uh, the quote that you talk about the biodiversity, how things are most fertile at the edges. And I think that's very powerfully true. And I think we have to be very careful that we don't chop off the edges and, um, and thereby really lose the vitality that, that is potential. Well, maybe we could be a little bit more specific about that, about how we do either that outreach to around the edges or how we define those boundaries, um, if boundaries are things that we have to define. You know, and, who, and who does the defining? Well, I, the, um I'm not sure who does the defining. I mean, I, I, I don't, as, you know, as, as a film festival programmer, want the film festival to be uh, held up any more as a, a perfectly accurate reflection of the diversity of Jewish thought than I do uh, a Sanhedrin or the Federation or, or anyone else. This is part of the plurality. We represent, as a festival, a certain snapshot of Jewish uh, thought, as, and our audiences reflect a certain kind of, um, a, a certain, mix. Um, that said, what's been interesting about the, the festival experience this year is um, you, you mentioned about the biodiversity. The edges are both fertile and I think you also quoted that they are scary. They are scary because I think what people um, are, are concerned about is um, a range of thinking that or, or expressivity or particularly thoughts around um, the future of the state of Israel that f many people feel threatened by many people feel threatened by, and what to do with that 
um, honest and legitimate and oftentimes extremely sympathetic uh, concern. Do we excommunicate the ideas? Do we say, no, the ideas are fine, but the people who express them are to be banned? Do we say, no, it's people are fine, but it's the groups that organize around the issues that are problematic and are outside the tent? I don't think that we ever want to stop having passionate arguments. I mean, passionate arguments have to stay within. It's when we start attacking people or institutions, I think, that, that we lose the richness of what those arguments can bring. And to, to look at where is the dissenting voice coming from, and when it's frightening to hear a dissenting voice from ourselves, from within the Jewish community, how do we go back to, how do we create a safe space in which the, the dialogue is an internal dialogue, that we, we want to hear all of, all of the vast opinions of the Jewish community and, and not, as you say, excommunicate those who frighten us. Well, I was going to say, Peter, that I, I think you're absolutely right that around the Israel issue, there is serious terror, and that this terror exists in the American Jewish community. Uh, by the way, I don't think the terror exists in the Israeli Jewish community. I think as far as politics go, there is a far greater openness and, and pluralism around the expression of political views in Israel than is often, um, quote unquote, allowed in American Jewish discourse. Uh, because we, are, we, we don't live there, we are afraid for them, we are terrified, uh, for, perhaps for reasons that ought to be unpacked, and, and so we, we create a much stiffer, stricter um, boundary. Uh, in the American Jewish community, there's rarely a problem in terms of uh, theological pluralism. Uh, nobody cares a hoot what anybody else believes about God or whether they keep the Shabbos or not. Nobody's coming to blows over that. In Israel, they come to blows over that, the divide between the secular and, and the Israeli. Um, we care a whole lot about the women of the wall, and there, there were, we, had, we had protests, and we had a service in, in, in the public square, and, and we had a lot of activism, we had people writing letters. Israelis don't care a whole lot about the women of the wall. It's not an issue that, that, that uh, makes a, a whole lot of difference to, to them. So, so uh, the thing that motivates us is, is fear around Israel. And that's where people push, push back. And that's where ideas suddenly become incredibly dangerous. And back to Carol's point, how does one create a safe context in which those ideas can be broached and discussed and brought to, to the fore and, uh, and examined? But it seems to me that a community is impoverished if it doesn't allow that to happen. It, it's striking to me that at this point in time, we've experienced the greatest freedom as Jews here in America, and yet we have the most difficult time expressing these divergent opinions. At a point in our history when we have such great opportunity and, and such great freedom, and, and very little threat from outside. It's... The, the, the fact that some of the diversity of, of opinion around um, uh, political concerns in Israel um, has seems to be more accepted and a matter of course in Israel than here was always something that I um, took comfort in when we would uh, show films, uh, for example, or have discussions. Uh, people would be surprised, for example, that, that films that were might be critical of particular policies in Israel were actually funded by the Israeli Film Fund. Uh, that the that the that this, the nature of the debate was commonplace in Israel. But I, I, I wonder, and I wonder for many of you who in the audience who have more um, regular um, experience in Israel than I do, um, if that is actually changing a little bit. And I, I ask that because um, this year, for the first time, I became aware of um, a, a, a cultural conflict in Israel around film. For years and years, it's just been very easy for Channel 2 or any of the, of the broadcasters or the Israel Film Fund to uh, fund films and projects and documentaries that we might see here as being um, harsh. Um, this year, uh, the main uh, organization that funds uh, feature films in Israel, the Israel Film Fund, uh, came under tremendous pressure. And in fact, the director was called before the Knesset to defend 
not just one funding uh, uh, action on a, one funding decision uh, 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 about a film, but to defend a whole list of films that were perceived by some as being too supportive of uh, the Palestinian cause. And so I don't know whether there's an anomaly or whether even in Israel there is now um, a certain kind of nervousness around what discourse is acceptable inside the tent and what needs to be left for people outside the tent. Certainly within the museum community in Israel, there have been instances in which there was a demand to take down an exhibition which was a struggle for survivors to get their heads around, yet it spoke very powerfully to a third generation. And the, the museum made a choice to maintain the exhibition, to keep the exhibition up. But there has been that, that dialogue within Israel what are the outer limits that we can push in terms of the com a conversation? I think that the, the farther we get from the uh, establishment of the state of Israel, the, the younger generations who have lost touch with the miracle, really, that those of us who were around when, when the state was formed uh, feel so strongly, I think that they don't have the connection, the, the personal connection, uh, or the historical connection. And they judge Israel on the basis of the way they judge any country. That's a problem of education. Yeah. And that frightening statistic, of course, that 70% of American Jews have never been to Israel. I think that's the statistic I heard. Oh. So how do you deal with education around Israel when 70% of American Jews don't make a choice to go and visit Israel? I, it is, I mean, it's, it's fascinating, you know, I, I do wonder whether the pluralism question changes a lot if, if Israel, if the question about Israel and its security and its political future um, is set aside for a moment. Um, I, I don't know if we have, um, a sort of um, congruence of opinion on on other aspects, or if there is if there's divergence of opinion in the United States or in the Bay Area, whether it it, it matters. Um, I, I know my predecessors in my position at the film festival, the founders, Deborah Kaufman and Janice Plotkin, are are here, and I've had many conversations over the years with them as to what the hot buttons of the festival films were over, over the years. And many of them were not about Israel or Arab-Jewish relations at all. It was about portrayal of, of, of victimization of Jews uh, during the Nazi Holocaust. Or it was about gay and lesbian identity in, uh, in, in Jewish life. And the, the struggles for Jews to define what it is that makes our community um, multifaceted and yet one seem to shift in time. And we may just be in a moment right now um, that where the focus is on, is, is on Israel. And that skews the conversation significantly because that's where the, that's where the terror is, as I think. The, the other religious issues, by and large, theological issues, don't motivate people to get, to get concerned. But I'm kind of wondering now mm -hmm. whether we need to know exactly what we're talking about when we mention the word pluralism. What does a pluralist community actually look like? Is a, is a pluralist community a community in which everyone agrees that every, everyone else's opinion uh, is, is equally right? Well, this, or, 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 is it, or is a pluralist community a community that says you're entitled to be wrong in your opinion, as you're entitled to be as wrong in your opinion as you like? And I believe that my opinion is right, but I, but I think that your opinion should be at the table even though I think it's wrong. I think that's a terrible opinion. Yeah. <laughs> That's what think, I'm saying. You know, I think that's a really important question. And um, you know, I really want the conversation to be among all of you. I'll just step in for a minute. And in terms of when I think about editing Shema every month, I have that question right in front of me. And one of the things that I have to always think about is, are there opinions that I will exclude? Are there certain uh, articles that are going to come in here and I'm not going to uh, print them? And one of the things that I, I always want to do is I want to make sure that people feel slightly unsettled in reading the magazine. And I think that a pluralist conversation should unsettle us. It should unsettle us around the edges and even in the center. It's, it's not that we need to um, be comfortable when we're talking to each other. 
but there's probably some boundaries that feel uh, out of bounds and beyond the pale. And, and you know, those are individual decisions that we probably have to make all of the time. Um, in terms of Shema, I have uh, rarely actually said, I can't print this article. Um, the one time we were doing an issue and um, I had asked Nate Lewin, who is a uh, rather conservative litigator before the Supreme Court, he's a very, very intelligent man, uh, to write an article. It was uh, an issue maybe about seven, eight years ago. And um, it, was, well, it was actually, it was during the Second Intifada. And it was looking at the peace process. And um, the, the piece I asked him to write didn't come in as I had intended it. And in fact, it came in and he said that one of the ways of responding to the Intifada would be to have uh, the families of the suicide bombers held responsible for the, the bombing. And how they would be held responsible would be to have them severely punished and assassinated, killed. And I remember, you know, looking at it and thinking, oh my goodness, that is so not the article I thought I was going to get. And I really felt so uncomfortable. That, that was beyond the pale for me. But I am really committed to including the wide spectrum of voices. And then I thought to myself, well, he's not a crazy person, and if he's actually thinking this, the better way of dealing with it would be to actually have somebody engage him in a dialogue about it. So I asked Art Green to write a response and you know, take his uh, essay apart and try to look at it from moral ground, and they ran side by side. So I think that that is a model for me about how we deal with pluralism and what the edges are, and they are very scary. Mm -hmm. But if we just rest on being comfortable, I'm not really sure what kind of a community it is. So well, how can we get more comfortable with discomfort? That's exactly what you're suggesting. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what pluralism is. It's a certain level of comfort with discomfort. And uh, it, maybe that's something we have to start talking about a lot, and talking about with our kids, and, and uh, bringing forward into the conversation. Plur, plur, the value of pluralism as a, as a social or a religious value is, is it predicated on the idea that we actually are, are exposed to the voices of pluralism? And this is what, what is another kind of tidal shift, I think, in the world that we're living in today, is that at least with regard to media, we can now pick and choose what views we're actually exposed to. We can silo ourselves into um, sectors of opinion and belief, and certainly through the internet and through the diversification of cable news and so forth, you can actually live in a bubble in which pluralism is, is, is simply a concept. It's not the Talmud which on one page gives you a, a variety of, of voices, but rather that, that in and of itself becomes a choice. You can choose to be pluralistic. Susan, you, I think, perhaps posed the question to me, I think it was you, what would an oath of allegiance look like for me as an American Jew? And that question is, is striking to me as an American Jew with a position in the community not as, as a, an independent individual, but that for me as someone who is connected to a community that's committed to hearing multiple voices, and the notion that we create a space for a civic and civil dialogue, and that each of us is, makes a commitment to that as representatives of the communities that we are a part of. And I, I know that this is a particularly liberal perspective on the Talmud, uh, but it, the Talmud is exactly as you describe it, I think, Peter, and that is a multiplicity of voices, all included, even though the, some of those voices will not accept some of those other voices, but they're all brought there for, uh, for the debate. And the notion that we are better off hearing only the kinds of opinions that leave us comfortable is, is to deny us of the possibility of the greatest growth. It is in the, in the encounter with the uncomfortable, that which discomforts us, that we have the possibility for greater understanding and, and greater growth. So all of those voices have to be 
uh, included simply, uh, the, well, the language that I usually speak is theological language, which is great because nobody really cares about theological language, so people stop listening. But, <laughs> So I get away scot-free. But, but it, one, could make the, one could make the case that the only way to actually come anywhere near the truth, anywhere near uh, the, the infinite God's truth, the only way to come even close to that is by having as many voices possible speaking about what they think God's truth is. And I didn't make that up. Rabbi Abraham Isaac Cook said that the first chief rabbi of Palestine. He said, just as a building is made up of very many different kinds of building materials, so our understanding of what God wants from us, our understanding of Torah has to be made up of the widest possible diversity of voices. That should be true in politics also. And, and, and then we get to the how-to. How do we make that work? How do we responsibly create that, that, uh, that arena within the Jewish community. Well, we'll beat anybody who doesn't agree with us. Oh. <laughs> oh, that, well, that works. <laughs> All right, so I know that uh, it would really not be a conversation if we didn't open this up for everybody to um, ask questions, make comments. And so that's what we're going to do now. I'd like to thank um, all of you for trying to at least answer some of those questions. It was a, it was a tall order. And um, I'll open it up to the floor. So Alana has a, a couple of mics. And if you want to ask a question, please just put your hand up and you'll get the mic. And then um, and the questions can be directed uh, to anybody on the panel or if you want to ask somebody in particular, that's OK, too. Yes, go ahead. And could you say your name, please? Great, sure. Yeah. Hi, my name is Cecily Saraski. I'm with a group called Jewish Voice for Peace. I'm so thrilled to be here. I am so delighted by this panel. It means so much. Um, our organization is an anti-occupation Jewish organization. We actually have chapters all over the country. We have thousands well, I'm of I'm not supporters. going to interrupt you, inter but could you just make your question? That's yeah. really important. Well, Thank you. Well, two things. One, I want to say, uh, Karen, you said something about we don't excommunicate people today. And I wish that were true. And I hear the compassion in your voice. And that simply isn't the case. And it doesn't feel that way at all. And we find that when we speak out about the occupation, we are very actively excommunicated. And my question is this. Um, none of the panelists have spoken specifically about the guidelines you brought up that the uh, Jewish Federation has just instituted. I have read them about 10 times, and they seem to me to be rather crude McCarthyite form of policing the boundaries of who is allowed to be Jewish and who isn't. Our members are already Jewish. We are part of your families, part of your shuls. We are part of the Federation. We are everywhere. How is it? How do you feel? And I'm wondering if anyone actually from the Jewish Community Relations Council is here to talk about, given this intense love of pluralism, um, how to defend guidelines that actually banish a huge portion of the Jewish community, including, by the okay. way, many iconic okay. Jewish thinkers. Right. Thank you. Yes, I appreciate thanks for it. for the question. Okay. Anybody want to take that? No. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I haven't read the guidelines more than three times. Um, I didn't read the guidelines to say that anyone who espouses the views that your organization espouses is not Jewish, nor did I read the guidelines to say that anybody who espouses the views that your organization uh, espouses um, can't be part of the community. I think they have very strong feelings about the ideas, but not about the people. You may not want to make that differentiation. But no one is saying you're not Jewish or that you can't be part of the Jewish community. What they are saying is you can't express that opinion within the Jewish community. And what, they, and what they're saying further is if you want to express that opinion in the Jewish community and have a program around it, we won't fund it. Now, it does seem to me that uh, communities have a right to decide what they will support and what they will not support. It's a really easy thing to do when you have um, community foundations are, are more likely private family-owned foundations, the Wexner Foundation, the Haas Foundation, the Goldman Foundation, and, and things like that, where they get to their private board of directors upon whom you have no uh, political clout, get to decide what kinds of things they want to fund and what kinds of things they don't want to fund. 
when it comes to a broad community federation, this whole issue has raised the real question about who really gets to decide what can be funded and what cannot be funded, what voices will be heard and what voices will not be heard. Uh, at some point, and maybe you would like to include Doug Kahn in this conversation, you know, I, it would be wonderful to hear from the people who drafted the policy what their, think, what their thinking was about that. My only, and, and, and it certainly is a controversial policy, but I think they, they probably went out of their way to try to be as inclusive as possible and, and not to stigmatize people or stigmatize thought, although they did. Uh, and there's the practical consequences, the consequence of funding. One of the questions that I have is whether if they're going to apply that, those guidelines to your organization, whether they're going to apply those guidelines equally to the organizations on the right that do not support the state of Israel, that are uh, anti-Zionist. I'm thinking about a whole variety of ultra-Orthodox organizations. Um, and whether they're willing to continue, whether they're willing to remove funding from Israeli organizations that support ultra-Orthodox communities that denies the Zionist philosophy and, and deny the right for, uh, even for Israel to exist as a secular government. That would be an interesting question, but I, I certainly understand your anger about it and your frustration. It, it's terrible to have uh, certain ideas not be part of common discourse um, and the, the only question that I, I have about it is who, who in a federated community actually gets to make that, uh, get, gets to make that decision? And, and I don't really know the answer to that question. Just to, just to press the whole issue of unease. Um, late, uh, um, just to press the issue of unease, um, Levy offered an interesting model whereby in Jewry there are a plethora of sub-communities that can establish or free to establish their own boundaries, but then there's the community that's the community at large. But don't all communities establish boundaries? The David Irving is beyond the bound, bounds of my, of the historical community. Norman Finkelstein is beyond the bounds of the Jewish studies community. Um, the only group that we've acknowledged that is beyond the bounds of our Jewish community are Jews for Jesus. Um, no one objected to Susan's formulation. To some extent, I think the, um, there's nothing that I necessarily disagreed with that the panelists said, but I think the panelists may have not allowed themselves sufficient unease. In other words, we all do acknowledge boundaries. And um, so, so what are these for you personally? And, um, and, and, and once you air that, the Talmudic tradition is a tradition of argumentation, but my God, is it bounded. And um, so what, what are they for you, Levy, for the other people on the panel? Oh, please start with somebody else. <laughs> well, I agree that every group has boundaries. And whether they're stated boundaries or whether they're you know, internal boundaries. But I think it, it, you know, it, it's different to talk about personal boundaries. And I mean, Peter talked about silos and how we read the, you know, political things that we're interested in or the cultural things that we're interested in, how that can, it can, you know, that can make us very stilted. And I think um, I, I still am staying with that thesis of, of the most fertility at the edges. So, you know, I think it's really different for individuals or even individual organizations to have boundaries and to say who is in and who is out, although I'm a huge proponent of permeability and of inviting people into the center. But it's another whole thing for the something which is amorphous, which is the greater Bay Area Jewish community to be having some representatives define it and say what's in and what's out. I think that just be, creates a whole messy, complex thing. Uh, and I, to, to, your, to your question, Steve, as to, uh, there, there are certain boundaries that are easier to articulate than others, um, both in terms of the kinds of groups that, that any of us who run organizations would affiliate with. Um, uh, you know, there, are, there are questions of, of, of coercion, deception, violence. I mean, the, the very, 
very basic, um, uh, hard, bright lines where you say groups or people who consistently advocate or, or act on those kinds of um, principles are outside the bounds. What's harder is when you're dealing with questions that are a more, a more delicate and, and, uh, and amorphous, or it's just simply ones that are, that are more easily controverted. Um, when we're in a moment where we are discussing and trying to understand what are collective or individual thoughts around the future of the state of Israel, to me, it's always much more productive to actually entertain the widest possible dialogue around that, um, even though I, I actually uh, applaud the attempts that the JCF and the and JCRC have begun to make to try to understand what might be some uh, some guidelines the, or or some policies. The question is, when you're holding the instrument of enforcement of funding, uh, then you run the risk of having a true chilling effect on dialogue and on thought and on association, uh, and those are um, consequences that I think we would not be well served by. I, I, I appreciate your question about personal boundaries and, and feel a, an obligation for myself to, to put my personal boundaries aside and to say I represent something bigger than my own personal boundaries when I take on the role of representing a, a community. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll, uh, Steve, I'll go out on a limb for you. <laughs> um, I represent an organization to the extent that I'm a, I, am a, I make decisions for that organization, but I'm not the sole voice there. Let, let, me, let me say that um, I have questions about whether Jews for Jesus should be excluded from the community. You'll never hear a conservative rabbi say that. <laughs> but frankly, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of Jews who are Jews for Jesus who are far more from and re Jewishly religiously observant than, than the vast majority of born Jews, Jewish Jews in the Bay Area. So that's something. I might draw the line at any group that wants to tell me that my particular belief is wrong or that I actually think this language is meaningful, that my particular belief won't get me into heaven, and that I, I must believe something else. I draw the line there, but maybe that boundary is not as as clear-cut as we always used to think it, it should be. Uh, so on, on the one hand, on the, on, on, in, the political, in the political spectrum, uh, I am very wary of wanting to include in discussions in my organization a spokespeople who, um, who say that the state of Israel should cease to exist as a Jewish state. Uh, people who want to criticize the policies of the government, come on down. Uh, people who on the, on the right who who, who feel um, that, that somehow a Vigdor Lieberman as a minister of Knesset ought to be uh, supported, bring it, bring it. Uh, anyone who but, but but anyone who has a uh, in my opinion anyone who has an opinion that has to do with violence against other people because they're other seems to be way out of bounds in my reading of Jewish tradition. So. Um, I, I think that, that, thank you for pushing us, I, I think that when you, when you get to these touchy subjects, it's incredibly difficult to know where to draw these lines. And all I can do is take my best guess at any given moment until my mind is expanded or I learn more to know that I, I've placed the boundary in the wrong place. Um, there's also something to be said about semi-permeable boundaries, but that needs to be further unpacked. I think it's my turn. Um, okay, uh, uh, Hans Kolbe is my name. I'm okay. Sorry, Hans Kolbe is my name. Um, uh, my wife and I are here because we got invited after a presentation of the what's it called? Uh, uh, our, about our Mein struggle? Kampf. Yes. yes, about Mein Kampf. Um, because in the in the audience afterwards, so there is a presentation here of a book that represents the responses to Mein Kampf. And in the discussion about that book afterwards, um, the author was asked uh, if she had non-Jews participate. 
And she was, a, I mean, she is a French lady, and she said, yeah, sure, I did. I, I mean, I just walked down the street. It didn't seem for her a, a reasonable question. But then the next question was, did Arabs participate? And the person who asked that question said he would be very surprised if they did, because most Arabs really just want to destroy Israel and hate Jews. And the person, and I don't know if he's here, who invited us, um, just kept going. So the lady was put on the spot, no one said anything, she answered the question, yes, Arabs participate, and then, and then we just moved on. And we were like 300 people sitting in a room, and no one said a thing. And, and I was ready to leave, I don't want to participate, and I would not, you know, read your magazine had you not pushed the other article next to it. I don't want to participate in organizations that don't respond to this. I think it's fine that we hear it, but we need to be ready to respond. And I sometimes lose my temper, it's terrible, and we should learn to, you know, to respond it like the rabbi does. He does it in a very calm way. Mm -hmm. And I thought Peter Stein did it very well also at the film festival. But sometimes we are pushed to the corner and we might not be calm. And we still need to do it. I think this is one of these lines where I think it's really important that we can keep this line. So what I wanted to push you on was the two examples you gave. One was Jews for Jesus are excluded and we all agree on that. And I was ready to stand up and say, why not? I'm really glad you spoke. The second one was you said, you accept someone who wants to kill the family of a suicide bomber. You accept them into yes. the tent. No, I, I well, do you, well, do you have a question? Let, like, let, tell me the question and then I'll try to respond. Well, the to question it. is, I think the rabbi spoke and said he would not accept someone, um, someone in the tent who agitates for violence. Right. So I just wanted to, right. okay, so I guess I, I'm pressing you. Yes. So, uh, you know, that's a, it's a very particular um, issue. And it's a different thing to talk about a journal and a program or something like that. So because I see the journal Shema as an opportunity to include a lot of different voices that can speak to each other, I would never have allowed uh, his essay to stand on its own. And I probably today wouldn't have accepted it because of the, because we now post, um, you know, the Shema is now digitized, and so you can take one article out of context, you know, and just, you know, it could run the internet within moments. So, but in, con in concert with another person who was able to actually take his arguments and unpack them, I thought that was a valid educational opportunity for our readers. And I would only answer it in that regard. Okay. Yes. Harry? Give it. Probably as appropriate for a discussion convened by Shema, I, I hear voices here, all of whom believe in pluralism. So uh, as far as I can tell, there's no one inside this tent who takes a different position. Um, <clears throat> but I'd like to find out from the panelists how then do you suggest a pluralist, a, person, a group which, which espouses pluralism deals with individuals, organizations that reject it and believe they have you know, right and et cetera on their side and, and are not willing to acknowledge pluralism in the other direction? I think we have to keep talking to them. I mean, I think that's what it means to be pluralist is that you, you are willing to listen and talk to everybody and if they're if they're not willing to listen back, you know, that's their issue. But I think that, I think there is something fruitful and I think what happens when you do listen to people who are angry and, and think you have nothing to say is that they end up listening to you. And that is one of the, the bonuses of being in a pluralistic place. Thank you, I'll, I'll, I will be quick because I have many things but I'll say them quickly. My name is Sidney Levy. I'm also from Jewish Voice for Peace. And to um, Rabbi Derby, we are not seeking funding from the Federation, but my question is whether Kehillah, if they do an event with any one of the mainstream 
uh, Presbyterian church, uh, mainstream Protestant churches, whether they are going to get into trouble. Whether Beit Kun, when they had in Rosh Hashanah, they had a Shministit come and speak last year, whether they are going to get into trouble, whether, whether they are going to run off. So there are b bigger questions. It's not about whether JVP is asking for money. And the concept of community, I would like to say communities. That's my first question. To Carol, quickly, I'm going very quickly because I'm not, I'm not going to take more than one minute. You talked a lot about a safe space, and I really, really appreciate that. At the same time, we cannot even rent uh, a space inside of the JCRC. We are barred from renting space inside of your organization. So those are earlier guidelines that I would like for you to address to see how, what kind of a safe space can we have if physically we don't have it. And finally, about the Jewish state. Uh, we are agnostic about it. I am not saying agree with our agnosticism or not, but uh, Jewish state is not Torah Moshe Sinai. There are many different ways of doing it. Can we please have a conversation to say what it means? Because all I hear is agree with the Jewish state or don't agree with the Jewish state. I don't even know what it means. Is it only demography or is it something more? And if we could have that conversation without being excommunicated, we would move forward. But we cannot because we don't have a physical space to do it. And because that even conversation, there's a red line and we cannot have it. Thank you. So I guess you asked me two questions. Uh, to the first question, I don't know whether any of those organizations can be funded if they do those things. I, I, I don't sit on any funding boards of the Federation. Uh, thank God. Um, I, I, I am aware of cases in, in which uh, organizations have been threatened with having their funding pulled from Federation if they invite a certain speaker um, or a certain speaker with a certain perspective. And, and that may actually be, uh, with these new guidelines, that threat may actually now have uh, s some teeth. As to whether we should be able to have a conversation on what it means uh, to have a Jewish state, um, I, I think that would be a conversation that would be interesting and worth having amongst a whole variety of different people. Yeah, let me, uh, can I just also add, I think it's really important to be able to make distinctions between um, hosting or facilitating a conversation as may happen at the JCC or happens right here uh, or happens at the film festival uh, and the implication that somehow hosting that conversation endorses or legitimizes or confers some kind of um, agreement um, with any part, any spectrum of the conversation that's being um, that's being presented. And that's, that's also a, a gray area that I'm not entirely um, uh, thrilled about with the current state of the of the Federation guidelines is this um, what begins to be an equation with um, presenting or hosting or let alone simply um, partnering uh, with an organization and the then the implicit assumption that therefore um, every piece of that organization's agenda you agree with or every link on their website is something that you would also put on your website um, it's a slippery slope and, and to, to answer you, we, we've also heard a lot about each entity, each institution certainly has the, the right to create its own boundaries. What are the boundaries of, of each institution, which I hope doesn't preclude your voice from being heard within the Bay Area Jewish community. It's a set of boundaries within an individual institution and, and finding the right venue and the right space to have that conversation is, is larger than, than any singular institution. Hi, I have the mic, so I'd like, to, um, I, I'd like to shift the conversation, if I could, to another realm of pluralism. Um, my name is Cheryl Weiner. I'm a rabbi. Uh, I have a post-denominational, trans-denominational training. And in a number of synagogues I've worked in as an education director, I've been told, no, we're raising up reform Jews, or no, we're raising up reconstructionist Jews. Um, you can't talk about obligation in terms of covenantal relationships because we don't have that in our theology, or we don't have um, circumcision as, as a... Um, uh, prerequisite for being accepted into the community that if you look at Jewish textbooks 
there are certain um, things that are in the life cycle um, books that are determinants of being part of the Jewish tribe. And then when you start to work in communities, those are called into question. Circumcision, um, uh, the ketubah, um, gay relationships. Um, there, there are all kinds of pluralistic issues and there's a big span from the East Coast to the West Coast. Uh, and I'd like you to address some of those issues uh, in the educational sphere. That sounds like a rabbinic question. Oh, God. <laughs> well, I, I, quickly, I'm not exactly sure how best to, to respond to you about this. But uh, without, without contemplating your question, which is a very important question, Without, and, and there's certainly uh, enough pain in your voice about the experiences that you've had to recognize that this is a very serious question, not just for you, but it, it broadens, it goes probably throughout a, a, a wide swath of, of Jewish life and Jewish community. Um, so I, I, I'd really rather answer this question having given it a tremendous amount of thought. Um, and, I don't, but I don't, and I don't mean to be glib. Um, it, working in synagogues, it seems to me that synagogues have a right to decide what they're going to teach their children and their adults and what they're not going to teach their children and adults. Some, some synagogues are going to have a very broad perspective on what can be taught and what ought to be taught. And some are going to have a very narrow perspective. And uh, it seems to me that synagogues, pluralism, have a right to make those decisions for themselves and, and if you find yourself working in a synagogue that doesn't allow you to express a full range of opinions that you think are important, it's probably the wrong place to, the wrong place to work. Um, there is a second issue when it comes to Jewish education, um, and specifically Jewish education that takes place in synagogues, because community schools are a very different creature um, and, have, and, have to, and have to work by different uh, rules. Um, but, but for example, I can, I can envision a, a, a Jewish educational community in which a whole wide uh, spectrum of views is permitted and encouraged to be discussed, and yet the community, through whatever vehicle it has for making these decisions, decides that although we, we welcome all these views to be discussed, when it comes to practice, we do this, we don't do that. So just an example, you might, you might find an educational context in which there is a broad conversation amongst the children or the adults or whoever populates this community that, about whether keeping kosher is an important Jewish ritual or not. And, and people will say, I, I think we should keep kosher. For this reason, people will say, well, I don't believe in kashrut because this is and it's a very interesting conversation. But when it comes time for lunch, the community has made a decision that we follow this rule and not that rule. And so there's a distinction to be made between allowing views to be expressed in the community, on the one hand, and the way communities decide to act after following a legitimate process of making, of making decisions. I would hate for that distinction to get lost. We're going to take just a couple more questions, and then there'll be time to chat during the reception as well. Uh, hi, my name is Mika Pellet, and I have a problem with the tone of the conversation because you all agree with each other. <laughs> um, the reason that I, I think we're having a panel on this topic is because it has become controversial in the Jewish cultural life of San Francisco in the last year, but we don't have on a panel anybody who is articulating a different point of view. Now, just to tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from about this, a few years ago, I stood in front of an audience of a Jewish film festival, not in San Francisco, but in New York, Lincoln Center, uh, who was, people were yelling at me, traitor, shame on you. Um, I won't take up the time now to tell you how I responded, but it did made, made me think about, you know, when a society feels that their survival is threatened, then you, you circle the wagons. Then pluralism becomes a luxury. Uh, and that's a point of view that I would have liked to see, to hear articulated here tonight. 
Also, you know, when we talk about culture, then of course um, we have to reach for our checkbooks. In other words, it's the funders that really matter. They control a lot of the, the range of conversation. Again, I would have liked to have on a panel somebody who makes decisions about funding in San Francisco that could put, put out an, an eloquent, articulate position of boundaries. Uh, so my question is to the convener of the panel, why don't we have representation like that on the podium? Thanks. Thanks for the question. And it's a very good question, and I appreciate it. Um, the, when we first convened the panel, we really were not thinking about it in terms of uh, the question about the federation and the guidelines. That just came out last week. It wasn't it wasn't on my radar that this was going to be a burning issue for this evening. So that's why we didn't have necessarily a Federation person on to speak. I think that the other question, this is the beginning of a, a conversation. You know, we, we could, we're more than happy to have more conversations. Uh, Shema runs, uh, you know, we've just moved here from, the, uh, from Boston, but we've run salons you know, in Boston, across the country. We're happy to host that here as well. Maybe you'll join us on the panel. I would be happy to have that. Um, so it's really the beginning of a conversation. And we don't always necessarily know where the conversation is going to go. Sometimes that unpredictability is really what makes it interesting. I, I chose the panelists because they actually do have different viewpoints. On they not necessarily maybe on questions about Israel, but I think that they're, they're nuanced and they're different. And um, I, I don't know if anybody wants to speak to, to any of that. Well, I, I, it's, it, would, it would be a different uh, tone or cast to the conversation, Mika, if, if somebody were here who, like in a Fred Friendly kind of you know, round table, resolved it is not in the interests of the Jewish people to have a pluralism of opinion about X, Y, or Z. I mean, that would, that would make a very interesting debate uh, it is a different form of the conversation, and maybe I, I don't think having this conversation is trying to uh, sweep that under the rug. That in fact, one of the reasons that we're here is because there has been a lot of um, debate and controversy. It's not just the festival; it's it's J Street, and it's the Daily Planet, and it's the Hillels, and it's uh, a lot of things happening in the Bay Area that seem to have um, exercised this mm -hmm. question. Yeah. I, I do agree with you, of course, that it's a luxury to have pluralism. It's a luxury to be at this place in time, here where we are, to be able to have these dissenting voices amongst ourselves, that, that we have the luxury of disagreeing with each other because we're not, we're, not, we're not feeling threatened by the outside. And I think it's those kinds of grounds that, that, that allow for this kind of conversation. And, and I do agree with you. This is a luxury that we have. I'm not sure I would agree with you, Carol. I, I don't think it's a luxury. I think it's fundamental to who we are as a people. And um, I'm not sure I could actually um, you know, be the editor of a journal that was committed to pluralism if I thought it was just a luxury. It reminds me a little of the 1970s when the women's movement wanted to make inroads. And you know, some people would say, you know what? We have more important things to do right now. It, that's a luxury. We'll we'll handle that when we've taken care of you know Vietnam civil rights. Blah, 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 you know. so turns out we don't all agree. Okay, <laughs> I'm not sure that I have a question for the panel, but I have heard some questions addressed somewhat in my direction tonight. I'm Doug Kahn from the uh, Jewish Community Relations Council. I do not speak for the Federation, but I was intimately involved in the creation of the policies and guidelines, along with some others who are, who are here tonight. And I think the key points I want to make for, for now are that the, every organization, and this includes organizations that fund others, has a right, maybe even a responsibility, to determine appropriate boundaries based on its core values. And what the Federation did here was simply to articulate uh, policy to ensure that its funding is aligned with its core values. And those core values include a twin commitment. One is an abiding support for a secure, democratic Jewish state of Israel. And another is 
strong support for a broad-based, lively, engaged, diverse community which can continue to discuss the vital issues of concern to our community in ways that will grow and sustain and enhance our community. And what the policy and guidelines try to do is to ensure that, in fact, in practice, we will be able to hold up both of those core values at a time when the polarization in the broader society is increasingly seeping into our own community. I would actually argue that in practice, the policy and the guidelines are more likely than not to help ensure continued strong dialogue and discourse and even expression of dissenting opinions than the absence of such a policy and guidelines would do. I know that we will live into it as it takes shape into our community, and I know that it will take common sense and good faith and a lot of trust in order to enhance the quality of our continued conversations as our community deals with these incredibly delicate and sometimes divisive issues.